for the Lord's church. 2 John verse 7. If you want to look at 8, 9, and 10, that ties in with it too. Apostasy posed such an imminent danger to the church that whatever Jude was going to write on that was common to all faithful Christians, he saw need to set it aside and deal with a special problem for the Lord's church. So he changed his original purpose to deal with whatever the particulars of that crisis was. Jude 3 and 4, and it's a one-chapter book, so that's verses 3 and 4. Now, if the danger of apostasy was already present in the first century while miracles were on the earth, the gifts were in the early church by the laying of the apostles' hands, the apostles were here, the New Testament was being written, then should we not be surprised after 2,000 years of continuing apostasy of every description that such exists for the Lord's church today and until the end of time? I think some people, even in the church, have the idea that the church must embrace every false doctrine of the world to the point where they deny the existence of God, the deity of Christ, and the inspiration of the scriptures before apostasy has taken place. Well, that's a, a, a view the devil would love to see us have. But you don't see that in your New Testament if you're a true student of it. You see that whenever error raised its head, the faithful dealt with that immediately. The reason for that, because number one, it's wrong. It shouldn't be tolerated by people who are of the truth. Number two, when one error is allowed to say, well, that's not that important, and therefore be accepted, Guess what? You can accept a second and a third and others. That's just the way we're put together. So there must be close attention to the teaching of the New Testament regarding our remaining faithful. I have the obligation to myself to examine myself to see whether I be in the faith. That's an obligation. If I'm going to serve God faithfully, I cannot neglect and that means every Christian has that responsibility. And elders over a church in their capacity as under shepherds to Christ have that responsibility. Every preacher has that responsibility in preaching what he preaches. Every Bible class teacher, every godly parent must be mindful of that. So we must give very close attention to these things. And that makes our study then of this little one chapter book of Jude especially up to date. And a thousand years from now, if the church is here, it will be up to date as it was a thousand years ago. So it contains great and important information for all Christians that each one of us need that we can overcome Satan. Remember what we must keep in mind. As Peter said, Satan is as a roaring lion going about seeking whom he may devour. Now in verses 1 and 2, Jude begins his letter in what was typical. And remember, as I've said the last several weeks, this letter is written to you and me. What do I mean by that? Christians. It was not written to the pagans. doesn't mean there's not material in it. It wouldn't help somebody if they're a pagan or some other false religion but it's written to members of the church of Christ. It's written to them for their good, for what they need to be faithful. So he identifies himself first of all, and he simply says that he's a servant of Jesus Christ. And he says, brother of James. Now it's considered highly likely that James uh, was a half-brother in the flesh to our Lord. And he became, according to Galatians 1.16, chapter 2, verse 19 of the book, a prominent leader in the church in Jerusalem. Thus, this means that Jude also was a half-brother in the flesh of the Lord, Matthew 13, verses 54 through 56. And that Judas would describe himself not as, look, I'm a, I grew up with the Lord. I'm his half-brother in the flesh. He didn't do that. Neither did James. He just described himself, as James did, as a servant of the Lord, but not his brother. 
And that certainly shows proper modesty and that he recognized the place of Jesus too. James chapter 1 and verse 1. He then, Jude does, address the original readers and no church or specific individuals are named. They are simply those who are called, sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. And it's for this reason that the letter of Jude has been categorized by as a Catholic, maybe some of us don't even know what Catholic means. It just seems meant meant worldwide or general. Or general epistle like James, 1st, 2nd Peter, and 1st John, and so on. I remember that brings to mind incidentally. We were up many, many years ago, over 50 years ago, knocking doors in New York. And of course it was uh, predominantly Catholic and they don't want to talk to you. So the local preacher, one of the local preachers, knocked on a door and a Catholic family member answered it and he told them what we're there for. And he said, no, I'm the Catholic. And the man said, this is just as Catholic as it can be. And the fellow took it. Well, of course, he meant it's just as worldwide in general as it can be. That just shows that the Roman Catholic was hemmed in on his own terms by what Catholic really meant because he couldn't identify it except as the Roman Catholic Church. But that's what Catholic means. He concludes his salutation, and this is where we're going to really begin, with a threefold, what we would say, benediction. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. I want you to keep that in mind as you read through what he says to these people that they need and how he describes these false teachers. To you means to Christians. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. So it's worthy of notice that Jude's purpose is to warn those good brethren of their day and time of those who he calls ungodly men. And he says they've crept in unawares, Jude verse 4. You know, things can slip up on us. Health-wise, you can think you're doing all right and you find out you're not. Family-wise, you can think things are going okay and then you find out something's not. Same thing's true of a great many things, but especially the blood-bought body of Jesus Christ. Things can slip up on us. Jude recognized that. And thus you have all sorts of teachings in the scriptures that we must be circumspect. We must be careful. We must be cautious. We must be examining all things, the light of the right divided word. And you can see this in Jude 4. So this is a necessary warning. And it suggests a real danger of being led away from the faith. The New Testament system of salvation. Or as Jesus said, the way, the truth, and the life. Because he's the only way to heaven. John 14, 6. Jude uses terms in his address that some would say teaches the impossibility of apostasy. That is that a child of God cannot so sin as to be eternally lost. Especially with the idea of preserved in Christ or Jesus Christ. Therefore, I want to, in this study, as we begin the study of Jude, to be looking at this first lesson under three terms, called, sanctified, and preserved. Called, sanctified, and preserved. First of all, those in Christ have been called. The calling is the gospel call. You'll see that Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, that you've been called with a holy calling. Now, this calling was not according to any meritorious work that some man or men sat down and figured out that this will work for us. And so by man's ingenuity, he figured out a way that he could be acceptable to God. And it's certainly not by the law of Moses. For Paul said in Romans, by the law shall no man be justified in his sight. No, the way of salvation, the way of forgiveness of sins, of reconciliation to God, of justification, 
of being faithful to him, of becoming a Christian, was according to God's own purpose and grace or favor before even time began. And this call, as I said earlier, came through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Gospel meaning glad tidings or good news. We become God's chosen and called only, underscore the word only, through means of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul writing to the church in Thessalonica said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, For we are bound to give thanks all way to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit, and belief in the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, of course, no wonder then that Jesus commissioned the church in cooperation with God, and we must remember the blood-bought body of Christ, the church of Christ, if it's faithful, works in cooperation with God. God has placed the gospel into our hands. We sometimes sing a song, into our hands the gospel is given. So by having the gospel preached to every creature, Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, then, of course, that gospel call is made available to everybody. And this is consistent with God's desire, as Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, that all men be saved. We would do well in our own living of the Christian life. Remember that when you look around at everybody around you, and when you see all these people doing whatever they do, good or bad, that God would have them to be saved. Notice he also said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6, that God offered his son a ransom for all not just some but for everybody and this is consistent with the Lord's unwillingness as Peter said that none should perish but that all should come to repentance 2 Peter 3 9 of course one doesn't know about God as he ought or Jesus as he ought to or the gospel plan of salvation none of these things except by the preaching of the gospel Having accepted the call by belief and obedience to the truth in being baptized into Christ, the only doorway into Christ, Galatians 3.27, then our responsibility is to make our calling and election sure. And this requires much diligence on our part. It's not something you can just take and do with haphazardly and nonchalantly. Listen to what is said by Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. And remember, he writes to Christians, just like Jude, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Now watch the obligation on our part. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he goes ahead and points out how concerned he was because he knew he was going to die at some point. And thus he says, verse 12, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in this present truth. Which again says, you can know something, but you need to be reminded of it. Notice if this doesn't happen, we'll end up like the children of Israel in the wilderness. In Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 19, again he writes to Christians, not to those outside the church, those who have heard, believed, and obeyed the gospel and been added to the church for the Lord, Acts 2, verse 47. Take heed, Brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. 
How do we think apostasy begins except that some member doesn't allow unbelief in some obligatory matter concerning living the Christian life to enter in? What are we to do? Well, in this case, he says, but exhort one another daily. While it's called today, while you have time, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, this is said to Christians, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Remember how Israel treated the words of Moses in the wilderness? For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? Members of, members of the church, and now Israel, a pattern for us to follow, lest we fall as they fell. Because they were believers, but then believed not. And then verse 19. So we see, and I have to ask the question here, do we? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. He's not talking about the person out here who's believing denominational doctrine. That didn't exist and wouldn't exist for 1,500 years in the future when this letter was written. He's talking about members of the church, Christians, children of God. So, God called Israel to enter the promised land of rest, delivered them, as we all know, with the plagues in Egypt, and then, of course, through the Red Sea, Moses, a type of Christ, leading them. But most were unable to enter. And there was a reason. Because of unbelief. And that led to lack of diligence on the Israelites' part. And Paul says... Members of the church, there is a lesson in that to you. And the New Testament speaks out and says, yes, and most of it's written to members of the church. So it's the need for faithful diligence that explains the many, many warnings against apostasy that's found in the scriptures. It also helps to understand why Jude thought it necessary to write this letter. So closely related to the concept of being called by the gospel of Jesus Christ is the idea that by God's grace, favor we don't deserve and cannot merit. We are also sanctified. There's one of our words, sanctified by God the Father. Now the words sanctify, sanctification, are translated from the Greek word hagizo. Hagiadzo, really, Hagiadzo, which means to make holy, to set apart for a special purpose. Do you think of your life in the church as being set apart for a special purpose? That you're not the run of the mill person like's out there in the world? That you live different from the world? That you're interested in God and serving Him and being what Jesus was when He was on the earth because you are a member of His blood bought body? So this means to make holy, to be dedicated to something. We're set apart for a special purpose. And Jude 1 harkens back to that. Then you notice we need to ask the question, what's the process of sanctification? Well, it's said to be the work of the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, 16 says, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, sanctified by the Spirit of our God. To the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and verse 13, sanctification by the Spirit. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 2, through sanctification of the Spirit. It's also said to be the work of the Word of God. Jesus recorded by John in John 17, 17, had Jesus praying, or John pointed out this part of the prayer of Jesus, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. In Ephesians 5, 26, Paul said to the church 
in Ephesus that he might sanctify by the word. So since the word of God is said to be the sword of the spirit, Ephesians 6, 17, the word evidently is the instrument used by the Holy Spirit to help to bring about sanctification. When you're baptized into Christ, you were buried with Christ in baptism. You were baptized into his death as a repentant believer who's confessed your faith in Christ as Savior. And thus your old sins are washed away. They're held against you no more. You rise a new creature in Christ added to the church by the Lord. In that sense, there's immediate sanctification. You are set apart in being baptized into Christ. But we know the Bible's full of material that says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. So there is a progress to sanctification. Immediately with the forgiveness of sins, you're added to the church, you're sanctified, you're not what you used to be. Some people understand sanctification, that it's all at once thing, and that's the end of it. There's no more sanctification. But I think you have to recognize the growth and development of the child of God once they're born of the water and the Spirit. The biblical evidence suggests that uh, we are to grow, and thus all these letters written to Christians and churches speaking of such things as we're dealing with. The church at Corinth was made up of members who were sanctified. And notice where? In Christ Jesus, 1 Corinthians 1, 2. You see, you can't have the right to grow till you're born. In the analogy here. You're born of the water and the spirit, John 3, verses 3 and 5. Thus, you're able to live in the church because you were born of God. You were baptized into Christ, only doorway into Christ, wherein God has located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, Ephesians 1, 3. He said they had been sanctified, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. Yet also, and this is interesting, he said to that same church that they were babes in Christ and he called them carnal. Now, carnal to us usually means something immoral. Well, they had some of that going on there too. But carnal as it's usually meant in these days means you're concerned about the material. You're concerned about how this world works. Your mind's not so much on doing God's will as it is the way people who don't know God live. Now, that might involve immorality, and it did in the church of Corinth, 1 Corinthians 5. But carnal doesn't just mean immoral things. It means just living for this world. And he called them carnal in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. As written to the Hebrews, those in Christ are sanctified. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. So what I'm saying is, is that to get into a set-apart, sanctified, holy justified, reconciled state, one must obey the gospel. But to then become more set, a, set apart, more like Christ, to grow up in Christ, to not be in a carnal state, which Paul said that some at the church of Corinth were, then there must be an ongoing process, a growth process. So it begins at conversion. And it continues as we grow in faith. And since faith comes by hearing the word of God, then we grow in knowledge of the Bible. We grow in understanding. So this word speaks of our wonderful assurance in Christ. We're being especially guarded as we're faithful in Christ. Peter uses a different word, fureo, to express a similar idea. In 1 Peter 1, 5. Paul yet used another word, sozitzo, to express his own confidence in God's preservation, 2 Timothy 4, 18. Indeed, Jesus reassured his disciples that no one could snatch them out of his hand, 
John 10, 27 through 29. But now this question. Does this mean that it's impossible for a child of God to sow sin is to fall away from the truth and be lost? Do we have no personal responsibility to remain preserved in Jesus Christ? Well, there's some personal responsibility. Jude uses the word for preserved in verse 21. And he said, keep yourselves. God has his part in our salvation. It involves doing for us what we never could do for ourselves. But God made us with the power of choice and the power of action. So therefore, those things that we can do, he's ordained that we do them. That's how we cooperate with God. And if you say there's some other way to cooperate with God, you explain it to me. We cooperate with God by submission to God's will. And we're back to Colossians 3.17. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. In fact, it's imperative that we cooperate with God. As Peter indicated, we are kept by the power of God through faith. 1 Peter 1 and verse 5. But faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10.17. And we walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. God provides the power to keep us safe. But we must provide the faith, which comes from our knowledge of the inspired Word of God. Jesus' teaching on security is for those who are believers. People look at belief and because of one all these, well, what, 500 years of salvation by faith only. And when they see believers, they don't see it in any other way than mentally assenting to the fact that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. That's not what believers means in the Scriptures. Believers means that, but a whole lot more. It means one who has complied with the Lord's will and is living by the Lord's will. You can see that in the way believers is used when it's applied to Israel wandering in the wilderness. And it says that because of unbelief, they didn't enter in. Well, that's synonymous with not obeying God. So belief or believers in this context means an obedient child of God. And James defines and deals with that in James 2 and says that faith apart from works is dead, being alone. And he said, you show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith with my, by my works. And there's no way you can show your faith to anybody except by compliance with God's will. Not, not accurately. Jesus' teaching on security is for those who are believers then, obedient to him, faithful in Christ. No one can snatch us away from God against our will. And that's what the Lord meant. When you're faithful to the Lord and the church, Nobody can destroy you. Satan can't destroy you. You can't be lost if you're faithful to God in the church. That's the assurance of our salvation. No doubt it was in the mind of the fellow who wrote, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Where do you think those words came from in the mind of a person except he read the words of God? But it doesn't stop you from rejecting those things and turning against them. Believers can become unbelievers. Obedient can become disobedient. And thereby in danger of losing their soul. And they will unless they repent. And that's clearly taught in the passages we noted earlier in Hebrews 3, 12 through 19. It's also taught in chapter 4 of Hebrews, verses 1 and 2, and many other places. Thus we are preserved in Christ as we are faithful to Christ and His church which church we were added to by the Lord when we were baptized for the remission of sins and we rose to walk in newness of life. It requires that we keep ourselves in love of God. I have a responsibility to be faithful. And thus, that's where we are. We who are in Christ are richly blessed beyond the mortal mind to grasp. We have been called by the gospel of Christ, to which call we responded, 
when we complied with the conditions of the gospel, faith in Christ, repentance of our sins, Acts 17, 30, confession of our faith in Christ, Romans 10, 10, and immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of sins, Acts 2, verse 38. Thus we've been sanctified or set apart for a holy purpose by God the Father as He works through, on us and through us by the Holy Spirit as the Word, the sword of the Spirit, guides and leads and directs us. I can't conceive the Holy Spirit doing anything or the Father doing anything or the Christ doing anything to the person who rejects the teaching of the gospel of the Word of God. On the basis of our faith, on that basis, we are preserved in Jesus Christ unto eternal life. But, dear brethren, forces of Satan are much at work. They were, when Jude wrote this, while the New Testament was being written and apostles walked the face of this earth. And it always will be. And what is our obligation? To not allow our faith to be undermined. To spend much time in prayer and supplication much time in the study of the Bible, much time in fellowship with faithful brethren, much effort on our part to exhort one another to abide in the truth. That's the way it works. Satan's going to try to harden your heart, and he's going to try to create within you an evil heart of unbelief. We can become spiritually lazy and thereby not maintain the diligence necessary to keep ourselves in the love of God. I close with this thought. I knew a man who was in the second wave uh, landing at Normandy. He went on through France, was in the Battle of the Bulge. He was captured in Germany, and he was wounded in Germany. But he was there when the Germans began their Ardennes offensive, and of course it was by surprise. And he said that it was night, and snow was everywhere, and he was on guard duty. And he was looking out across a valley and up the side of a hill and said something caught his eye in the dimness of the night, and night light. And it would look just like little balls of snow would run from here to there and stop. Others run here to stop. He stop. So it looked just like balls, snowballs rolling down the hill. And he watched it for a while. And he said he finally called back to wherever the headquarters were to his superior officer and told what he saw and described it just like I've described it. And the officer said, be sure those snowballs don't blow up in your face. And it was the beginning of the Germans already in defensive, and they were in their snowsuits. And at that distance, he was seeing the troop movement come toward him. Now, you think about that. You're in the army of the Lord. You're a soldier of Christ. You're to be faithful to God, and you know what Satan's doing. And Paul said, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. And I have to always ask the question, are we? Be wary lest those snowballs blow up in your face. Because it's by deception and lies that Satan seeks to lead us away from the truth. And most of the New Testament was written to us as Christians to not allow them to blow up in our face. If you're not a child of God this morning, we've studied the plan of salvation. We have seen once you become a Christian what is demanded of you. We've seen what Jude wrote. We've seen why he wrote what he did when he intended to write something else. There was a sense of urgency. There was an emergency, and he had to deal with it, and it was for the good of the brethren. It wasn't necessarily that which they may have said, well, we wanted to hear this, but it was necessary. And this time last year, not even a year ago, wouldn't we have thought ourselves ridiculous to be looking at one another right now with these masks on? Could you have foreseen that? Could you have even had any idea? Quickly, things change. Are we ready for those changes so we can face them spiritually with the truth of God being lived in our lives? If you're a child of God and you've sinned, you need to repent of those sins. Come confessing them and pray God for forgiveness. If you need to respond to the gospel invitation, we invite you to do so while we stand and sing.